The following podcast is being brought to you by the Defy Life Podcast Network. Welcome to Aftergate, powered by the Defy Life Network. Aftergate is a podcast series highlighting Colgate alumni of color in their professional endeavors, Aftergate. Aftergate is hosted by Alvin Glimp, a.k.a. Al, and Herman Dubois, a.k.a. Jerry. We are doing Aftergate because Colgate University has produced innovators who have changed the world every day. Yet many alumni of color in the mainstream Colgate community are unaware of the amazing accomplishments of Colgate alumni of color. If you're into all things comics, you have to check out Take a Knee for Marvel vs. DC your go-to podcast for comic and superhero discussion, debates, polls, and more. Tune in as regular Scott and Ozzy Killmonger chat about your favorite comic topics, and you never know who may show up for an open mic or what will be next on their favorite, One Gotta Go. Take a knee for Marvel vs. DC, every Sunday, powered by the Defy Life Podcast Network. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, this is Alvin. I am the co-host of this show, Aftergate. I'm here with my homeboy, friend for 30 years deep, uh, Eman Dubois. How you doing, brother man? What's good, brethren? Uh, you know, not bad. You know, not bad. As always, it's good to be here. Um, looking forward to another great conversation. And, um, you know, good to check in with you. It's always good to hear your voice as well. So, likewise, appreciate likewise. that. So let's handle our uh, Colgate question, which would be, what is your favorite ex- extracurricular activity when you look back? Anything stands out? What was your favorite? Wow. I mean, I, I, I definitely say I had so many, and, and uh, I'm going to go with a an informal extracurricular activity because it would not be something you'd ever find in any Colgate literature, but I do had, I had the fortune of having... Uh, an incredible mentor in uh, Dr. Eleni Tedla, who mm. in many ways sort of, as I look back now as a professional, as an adult, as somebody who's mentored young people, um, I, I, I cannot uh, even begin to appreciate all that she did for, for me and for many of us on campus while she was there, not even understanding maybe the political climate she may have been up against because uh, the times were different. Uh, the, 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 the ideas of diversity and multicultural education were just being kind of introduced conceptually and wasn't a popular subject matter. Um, and yet she, she, she nurtured and showed us a degree of sort of uh, love that was both innate, but also very professional and, and schooling us. And the number of times we had informal meetings and discussions and group sessions um, where she would provide us with guidance um, to me, what was one of the greatest extracurricular experiences over the four years at Colgate. I got my first work study job was at the um, cultural center before the new cultural center when we were in the buildings and grounds maintenance mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. building. And I was a student uh, sort of admin receptionist there. And I stayed at, I worked for the cultural center for four years as a part of my work study shifts. And uh it was really her her leadership and her guidance um, that was unofficial and, and not part of her job description that I think was really uh, the silver lining for me at Colgate. Uh, I echo that um, totally. Um, I'm glad and appreciative that you mentioned her and what she contributed to both of our um, time there, as well as the Culture Center itself and what it meant to us while we were there because I started there and probably through your advice, right? I didn't get there until I my, started recruiting everybody to come right. work. At the <laughs> I got <laughs> there the second semester of my freshman year. I had started working in a dining hall as my first job. And while it was, it paid and it was just, you know, gave me money. Um, it was very convenient. What Cultural Center provided for me was not only just a safe space, but for me particularly, who had a rough first semester academically, it provided me an opportunity to study and it definitely helped. Um, it would be real easy to say um, the, the DJing uh, as my, free, my favorite extracurricular, DJing provided me a true understanding of passion. And I don't think I had that 
coming into Colgate. It was the only thing that I did while I was at Colgate that I was consistently early for or on time. That was the only thing ever. I hear you. I hear you. I hear that you. I enjoyed it that much. And so what it taught me was this idea that why you do some of the things you do in your life. And it's not necessarily about money. Mm-hmm. It's about the reward or you that have it provides to. you. Or right? It was joy. That it really gave me joy. And so I never mm-hmm. wanted to not have something like that in my life Mm -hmm. and that has definitely helped me be a better person in life Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so shout out to rcu and night flight yes sir all right um so let's see we have as i was preparing for this show one of my i have two memories of this guest one is i remember him coming up to campus and speaking in the cultural center and when we were students. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember hearing his story and hearing a shift in his engagement with the institution, like he was returning back to the fold. And I remember that offering me some insight because at that time, the alums that I was familiar with as a student on campus was Chaconi, um, Leroy, Potts, and um, that was pretty much it. They were the main folks that I, when I mm-hmm. think of alums that stood out to me as these were people who've helped me get to where I was. I, but then I uh, started this connection with this brother because it was like, okay, who's that? Another one was Van Van, Van Dam, uh, Van Dam. I can't think of it. Van Dam, right? Another one who was, I remember. Second memory of him is that we both got our maroon citations together. And so another connection, and then that actually brought back the memory of when I was a student. It was that, I was like, I remember him. <laughs> wow, this is dope that we're both getting this award. So um, that being said, I'd like to welcome to our show, uh, Brother Leroy, Leroy Cody, class of 71. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome to the show, brother. Well, thank you. It's, it's uh, I feel blessed to be invited, and I'm so thankful that you thought of me. Um, I think this is mm-hmm. terrific uh, to uh, memorialize and get people talking about their experience, and so uh, I appreciate it, I, and, and I hope that um, many people will take advantage of hearing from a variety of terrific alums i i will say that i mean uh, so far diana's been the only female come on now we got we we are going to uh do our best and um i appreciate that our audience is noticing because it does matter yeah we notice it as well um we've just had several um what do you call it reschedules uh, we got three or four in the in the lineup, the but it is okay. you know we are doing our best. But as fate would have it, we've had four or five a brothers. Little, in a little row. uneven <laughs> at the moment. Okay, but got we're it. working on it. We're working. because it's it's come up a couple of times, both uh-huh. internally and externally, and we, okay. we want to be clear that it's not that for lack of effort. Uh, it's just been uh-huh. the nature of the scheduling process. So, uh, I first um, I don't recall the particular. Uh, event when I came back to campus, but uh, I hope during the course of the conversation here, we can talk about how I began to, you know, get back into activities and get more engaged with, uh, with Colgate and what it means for alums of color to, to stay engaged and be engaged because it can be so meaningful as apparently I have, I, I was with you. Before we jump into some of the sort of a, a formal question, I'd like to expand upon a little bit of what you just said and, and ask the question. Um, there was a word you mentioned sort of at that time you chose to re-engage. So it implies that there was a some form of disconnect or separation that went beyond just physically graduating from Colgate, but maybe some type of shift in, in your thought process, in your spirit, where you went from uh, 
going on to whatever was next in, in, in the chapters of your life post Colgate to then realizing at some point, you know what, I need to reconnect. And, and I, can you talk a little bit about like sort of that, what was that time in between what might have been, you know, was influ influencing you? What were some of the reasons why you might have disconnected and then chose to reconnect? Uh, I think that that's important context because it, it is something that's, that's come up quite often in, in sometimes subliminal ways in some other discussions with some of our other guests and in other ways more direct. Um, and I would be very interested in your take on, on, on what your reflections uh, you know, indicate with that experience. You know, I graduated, when I graduated in 1971, um, there was a great feeling of ambivalence about the um, struggle that I went through um, for four years at Colgate. Um, and I, I attribute that to those feelings to, at the time, to being quote unquote angry. Um, I remember thinking that as I left, you know, if I never see this place again, it will be okay. Um, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. you know, life goes on and you gain, first of all, perspective and maturity and distance doesn't hurt <laughs> mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and you know, you put things in better perspective in different perspectives. So I evolved and, and my, my feelings evolved. And I also want to say that, you know, I describe it as struggle, but uh, you know, I, I form my, my best friendships, lifelong relationships during those four years. I had a lot of fun along the way, but it, it had nothing. It wasn't so much about the institution, but it was really about the, the camaraderie and the fellowship with people, um, the fun that we had, the fun that we made along the way, because it wasn't just you know, um, salt mines every day. Mm -hmm. Though sometimes you want to paint that that picture in retrospect, but it wasn't. So, so with that being said, uh, take to take us back to uh, your four year tenure there, which I guess we're looking at sixty eight through seventy one. Would that be accurate to say 67. that? Sixty yeah. seven. Sixty seven through seventy one. Okay. Yeah. What 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 was going on in the world? What what, what wow. was sort of the current events or the reality of the times that um impacted your your sort of campus experience, your Colgate experience, um specifically while you were a student, just so we can put it in a frame of mind so folks understand that Hamilton has its bubble effect, but the rest of the world is still going on. <laughs> exactly. Well, but you know, look, so so from a civil rights standpoint, I'm going to go way back. I mean, you can go back to 1619, I suppose. But, you know, I look at the developments of the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, the struggle for um, civil rights and the particularly the you know evolution of uh, civil rights from nonviolent protests to more um, strident you know uh, and, and angrier forms of protest or speaking out. You know, we, um, a, a class of 16 black men arrived on Colgate's campus in the fall of 67, and we doubled the black population. So we are kind of the first significant wave, and this wasn't just Colgate, but it was starting to happen uh, across the country. The first significant wave of African Americans um, coming into historically white and exclusive colleges. Um, there had been brothers here before us and, and keep in mind, this was a all male school. I have no idea what I was thinking when I was 17. <laughs> um, but before us, it seemed like there would be two or three per class. And then all of a sudden, six, 
18 of us show up and it becomes 36 on campus. Mm. And so, um, you know, I think that's kind of the, the, the initial backdrop. That said, so, so, so there was a lot of struggle going on in the 60s. We were aware of that. I was aware of that. But as I came to campus, I, 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 I really was thinking just about being a student. Mm. Just, you know, come, put my head, nose to the grindstone and study. And quickly learned that, you know, there were problems even at a place like Colgate. And certainly during the course of the spring, you know, there was the sit-in, there were, um, you know, protests, there were the, the Association of Black Collegians actually had been formed in the spring of 66, spring, spring excuse me, spring of 67, just before we arrived on campus. So, you know, the, the, that's kind of the backdrop. And then you, you, you arrive on campus and you realize, you know what, you just can't, I, I, at least I was not able to only be a student that I felt that I needed to be part of whatever the solution was uh, to help make life for ourselves more palatable uh, at Colgate University. So that was, that's kind of the backdrop of those 18 young men coming to campus at that time and our awakening to the realities of not just academic life, but also social life, um, school life, racial insensitivity, and what we now know is structural bias throughout the system. And can you give a little context to where your origins were prior to Colgate? So was, uh, we, we've had different guests from different parts of the country, and I always find that amazing things we did not know about their hometown or where they came from, which shaped who they were, impacted their filter and lens going into Colgate, and then Colgate had a whole different idea and agenda for them when they got there. Sure. Well, I... Um... My, yeah, my, my background is that I'm an Army brat. My dad um, joined the Army. Uh, he um, is from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Dirt poor growing up. Wow. Uh, was a good student, got into Alabama A&M, and uh, uh, dropped out to enlist in the Army in 1942. Mm. And... Um, the rest, as they say, is history. Mm. My mother, he met my mother along the way. She's from Kansas, also uh, poor working class, you know. Uh, and so, how long did he serve? Humble roots, right? How long did he serve? My father ended up serving 30 years and uh, he earned a battlefield commission. So, he became an officer during World War II. Uh, he rose uh, to the rank of lieutenant colonel before he retired uh, uh, soon after I got out of Colgate. And uh, he had, um, and I, I should also say that uh, along the way, the Army paid for him to get a master's degree in radio and television communication in, uh, at Ohio State. And then after he retired from the service, uh, he became, uh, he, he, he joined the faculty at a community college in New Jersey, and he went on to earn a, 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 um, a PhD at Columbia. So my dad was all that. <laughs> fascinating. fascinating. And, and that, and that actually kind of framed me in a, in a, in a significant way, because, you know, he, he was a big personality and, you know, I think I'm something too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nothing you know, there, there, there are these two male egos fighting for, uh, you know, credibility in the household. So I, I wanted to get away. I mean, I, I knew that I wanted to get out of the house and go away and be my own man. And then, um, as I tell people, um, be careful what you wish for, because mm -hmm. during my senior year in, in, uh, in high school, he was transferred to Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, after my graduation, my mother and sisters joined him, and I was in the U.S. pretty much by myself. Wow. But, but Jerry, back to one of the points that you made. You know, I, as an Army brat, 
I lived, I probably went to eight or nine different schools and mostly the, the, the South, like Carolina and Kansas and North Carolina, Ohio. Uh, um, I was in Japan uh, when I was, two, you know, three years old. So, you know, there are places uh, around the country that, I, and every, every stop was a year, maybe three years, you know, before we would be relocated. Um, I'm the oldest. My sisters uh, are, we're all three years apart. And uh, I was just fortunate that uh, uh, my high school years were all in uh, one place. And that was Hempstead High School in Long Island. So, okay. And I mm. became a lacrosse player. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, Hempstead was a middle class community that was in transition racially. But at the time that we were there in the mid '60s, um, I mean, my high school was still uh, still a, a, an excellent high school, probably 60-40 uh, racial mix, uh, and I don't remember which was which. <laughs> you know, it was, <laughs> which was 60 and which was 40. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but um, you know, it was it was um, it was a a. a um, it was what I knew to be relocating every so often. I, in my early years, I went to segregated schools in North Carolina. And then as we moved to Ohio, you know, uh, schools were technically integrated. I certainly had my first white school teacher when I moved to Ohio, although I think the class was mostly uh, African American. And then, you know, uh, in other places, we lived in the north, and uh, the schools were integrated and things of that sort. So, and certainly my high school was. Um, in addition to playing lacrosse, I was uh, class president in a senior year and things of that sort. So, um, that's a little bit about my background. Okay. okay. So, definitely, this is why we appreciate the sharing because you we're always making connections. I didn't know you grew up. Well, I had spent time in Hempstead, right? And so I'm from Rosedale, which is oh, yeah. very close to Long Island and Adjacent. Nassau County. And have, <laughs> right, right. I actually have, as a kid, rode my bike from Rosedale to Hempstead. And you being familiar, you can, that was a good 15, 16 mile stretch. Wow. I got in a lot of trouble back then. But um, I'm curious to hear, um, as you are talking about one, what prepared you who you were coming into Colgate and even as you describe some of the situations how Colgate was in the process of shifting in terms of the racial dynamic I can only imagine us being there 15 years later what we remember what it was like being on a campus where you went from 8 to 16 and it ultimately during your tenure shifted where women were coming to campus so I'm curious to hear, take us back to what life was like for you, for the other students. Give us, paint that picture for us, because to me, that's fascinating. I'm even curious to know if you're, um, if you know why Colgate actually started to enroll women. Like, was that being discussed amongst the students? Did you know this was coming down the pipeline? Did y'all have any role in women coming on campus? I'm real curious to hear that story. Okay, so I'm the the um, shift to coeducation uh, was under discussion for years, and although at the at the student level we're pretty far from any kind of knowledge or decision making, but we knew that there was conversation going. We knew that amongst the different options being considered was perhaps forming um, affiliations, for instance, with Skidmore which was an all women's school uh, down the road or some other such affiliation or whether obviously whether we should go it alone and just uh, admit women directly. So um, it's, it, it was not um, something at the forefront of any of our thoughts at the time. So when in um, the fall of 1970, the first class of um, freshman women were entered Colgate. Um, to be honest, as a senior, 
I just didn't care. <laughs> I didn't wow. care that much. Um, you know, we had already endured three years of <laughs> driving through um, the, 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 the two lane highways from uh, Colgate to Oneonta to Syracuse to Well what? College, you know, whatever it was in the middle of snowstorm. Hello. <laughs> Tell it. <laughs> Route 12B? Route 12 be the exactly Utica. right. So, <laughs> uh, but, you know, as a senior, I'm focused on just getting out. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Salvation. <laughs> That's right. Now, otherwise, I think if we think about, you know, what was life like? Uh, there was a lot of um, our presence at least amongst ourselves and and maybe because a lot of us would us being the the black man who freshmen particularly who were living up on the hill we're talking with each other eating with each other every day you know maybe you know not in, not necessarily in a group but we found ways to 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 get to each other and so the issues of what we were experiencing were being shared amongst each other and it, and it wasn't and and I think for any 18 year old, 17 year old, you know, making an adjustment, you know, some, some came from environments where they had gone to school in an integrated situation. Some had not, uh, people were from mostly the Northeast, a lot from New York city, but, you know, differing backgrounds. Um, and so it seemed like a struggle even before we got to the point where there was, uh, the, the, the protest in the spring. Um, we wanted to have more, and the ABC was getting going. Uh, we would have weekly meetings. Uh, we did um, and ask the administration for uh, a private room where we could dine together, and that was down at uh, the in one of the rooms around the dining hall, and so that we could have a weekly meeting and have a chance to just have our meeting and and also fellowship and get to know each other. So, you know, um, life was tough. Uh, you know, the memories of those days was um, the, the, the ground being white with snow, the skies being gray and white, and uh, mm -hmm. white people <laughs> mm -hmm. everywhere you look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, schoolwork was demanding um, uh, and uh, took, obviously, a, a lot of time, and uh, you felt you didn't feel, you know, we, I think most of us were prepared, but, you know, um, nonetheless, it was demanding. Some of us experienced some um, racist behavior and attitudes amongst the, um, amongst the faculty about different things. Mm -hmm. So um, it, was, it was adjustments and some hard adjustments. I think the other thing is, look, we, again, like any 18-year-olds, we're discovering ourselves too so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um any when you look back at that time are there accomplishments that that kind of stick out things that you are very proud of um things that you miss how do you kind of process that time in your life um accomplishments things that i did i you know look i enjoyed uh, the sporting events whether football or basketball uh, i am a sports fan I played lacrosse. I tried to play lacrosse in my um, freshman year uh, and was out for the team um, until such time as the, um, the, the um, sit in. And I didn't, I never picked up a stick after that. I just mm -hmm. went, you know, it, it was no longer on the radar. Mm -hmm. it, and that's after coming to the school and, and looking at schools, I wouldn't consider a school that didn't have a lacrosse team. Mm -hmm. But after the after the sit in and, and after what we did, you know, I was not interested in going back and playing. But um, the um, WRCU, you know, we got, you know, outside extracurricular stuff, I would say that extra, I learned as much outside the classroom at Colgate as in the classroom. Were you on the radio? You mentioned RCU. I was a, I was a DJ on the radio. I okay, was okay. Um, um, the Funky Judge. Okay. <laughs> okay. And that I, was your name? I was your, myself funky. after Frankie, uh, Frankie Crocker. 
Crocker, Frankie Crocker. Say word. That was one of my <laughs> favorite radio personalities, Frankie Crocker. That's and it. um he used to play this song as he closed his show. There I go, there I go, there That's it. I go. And how that song continually sticks in my head. I might have been a teenager, 13, mm-hmm. 14, 15. But my mother listened to it. I listened to it. And I thought he was just one of the greatest yep. personalities ever. Frankie That's Parker. right. So you were the I funky the right judge. Icon, and I was patterning myself after that, after him. And they had me on in uh, something like 6 o'clock in the morning, which means nobody was listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that shift. I've done that shift. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. Uh, I, you know, and I did other things. Uh, the student uh, J- judiciary committee I was on, and, but most of my activity, and it started slowly. But you know, um, Association of Black Collegian, and by the time I uh, got to senior year, I was uh, an officer. I'd become a vice president of that, and, and I think notably, uh, you know, as part of one of the outcomes of the. Um, sit-in was we had a, made a demand that there be a cultural center. And as part of that, we wanted to have a dining facility as well in that. It took uh, two years more, basically two years for them to, to, uh, to get around to uh, providing that. And so it was our senior year when it, be, you know, when it was ready and it was available. It's the current building that houses uh, human resources. Mm-hmm. Um, but on that top floor, were uh was a dining hall and uh, i was the first manager of the dining facility during that year Uh, wow and so that i consider and and again in terms of my personal um you know discovery uh, my path along the way during colgate and working with abc and with other organizations was you know, discovered that I had an interest in, in business and in management and things of that sort. And so um, that fit right in, you know, being the manager of that facility. So if I can now, and I'm going to uh, um, label you as uh, one of the cultural center founders, uh, because uh, I think that uh, it's worth uh De- delving a little deeper because I, I would love for you mm-hmm. to share a little bit about why there was such a need and, and, and what was the uh, inspiration behind the group of students who advocated for that because I do think that you know decades later uh, cultural centers are, are, are around campuses around the country and, and in some cases there's a lack of understanding of what their maybe original purpose was and the vision behind why they were needed versus now just being a building that can be, a box can be checked off campus that fall every and fall under any category from affirmative action to, you know, uh, multicultural education and inclusion. And, 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 and I think that, you know, we, we need to always know sort of where we've come from and, and why the cultural center even exists today at Colgate and uh, that oral tradition is not necessarily passed on. So please enlighten us. Sure. Um, you know, I think when all schools, um, majority white institutions began admitting black students. There was no, um, I think that they, there was no perception that, that there would be any significant cultural issues. They bring in students, they go to school, they live in the dorms like everybody else. Uh, and that there was not the recognition that there were, you know, significant cultural dis, uh, differences, and that there would be, uh, you know, people have to make adjustments, um, you know, personal adjustments, uh, culture matters. Uh, that there, the sense of being, you know, um, recognized for who you are, valued for who you are, valued for the um, uh, cultural things that are meaningful to you. Uh, there was no thought of that. And I'm sure that even for women, I've heard, um, you know, the first women at Colgate, you know, talk about that, you know, they were kind of dropped in here too. And, uh, you know, 
there are urinals in the in, in the dorms, you know, in their bathrooms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just, um, you know, I, I don't think there was any real thought planning um, or appreciation for cultural differences. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for us, we needed safe, safe places, places where we would feel comfortable, uh, where we could be ourselves uh, without having to educate somebody else or, uh, or worse, which is, you know, protect ourselves, you know, uh, you know, from, uh, the, um, from slights and indignities and, um, you, you know, just insensitivity, you know, it, 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 it wasn't thought. So what we wanted to do was be able to gather in, in safer places and be ourselves. We wanted, a a place to study quietly without being bugged or bothered. We wanted to have access to uh, in a, a library where we could have access to books that were meaningful to us, maybe not necessarily the ones that are down in the library, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the dining hall piece of it was, again, so much gets, food brings so many people together, right? Mm -hmm. and and. And I, I guess I would say food and drink, but but certainly food is something that pulls people together, something to talk about, something that's that's uh, comforting to all of us if it's done well, obviously. Thank you. Um, and 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 Alvin, just to reiterate one of Alvin's points, is there anything you look back upon and miss from Colgate? And 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 uh, yes, what, what might those? What be? I miss is that uh, the camaraderie, the people. The fun that we did have, as I said, it wasn't all uh, struggle. It, we made our own fun. And I have dozens of episodes and events that uh, uh, I remember fondly and we can laugh and joke about now. So uh, my best friends um, are, there are four of us who uh, stay very close. We happen to take advantage of Colgate's exchange program with Lincoln University, uh, historically black school just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, and that's a story in itself, how that came about. But we, um, we have so many uh, fond memories uh, that, that developed through the years. And uh, that, that would be, I think, the biggest miss. What I'd like to do now is just take a quick pause, um, make sure we get uh, opportunity to give love to our sponsor. After the break, we'll come back. So this episode is sponsored by Hope Murals. Hope Murals is a nonprofit that provides adolescent youth with an interactive experience of creative expression via an urban arts platform that stimulates both mental and physical development. Please visit their website at www.homeheroes.org to learn more and find ways you can support the work they do. Welcome back. Definitely want to thank Hope Murals. Uh, we definitely appreciate all that you do with our adolescent youth. Uh, if you want to be a sponsor, don't forget, you can email us at afterthegatepodcast at gmail.com. We're always looking for additional businesses, initiatives, and organizations to promote. Uh, before we get back, let me show some love to our network. Uh, we got dope shows like this at Defy Life Network's podcast hub, which is www.defylifepods.com. You can find our podcasts and a lot of others. And we are just continuing to expand our services that are carrying our show. So we're not just on Spreaker, remember, we're on Spotify, iHeartRadio. Definitely don't forget the written content at GoDefyLife.com. And our branded apparel at DefyLifeGear.com. What I would like to do is now lead into our next question. Um, this is exactly why we're doing this podcast, to share information to the alumni of color networks. So one of the things that I think is evident in listening to your story is that we have come a long way from enrollment 
demographics to where people live and how they live, I think we've come a long way. You know, it has definitely been a journey. But now the question is, where are we now when it comes to DEI? I'm curious to hear your perspective on not only where are we now, but where are we going? What's the vision from an uh, institutional perspective? I know you've been involved. I know you've been engaged. There's been some significant um, changes in leadership over the last few years from the president is bringing a different energy from that seat. Um, uh, Dr. Hux, I think that's critical. Um, and then uh, Ronnie, um, Veronica has made some amazing strides in terms of getting us engaged. And so from your seat, can you give us your perspective? Yes, it there, you know, one of the things about being, um, having graduated 50 years ago is, you know, I have a 50 year view, uh, seeing things from where they were near the beginning to where they are now and being in the room as a trustee. Uh, and then in particular, um, you know, focusing now on the period of basically the last year or so, I was, I spent nine years as a trustee, um, hit the term limit in May of 2020. Uh, so I'm now trustee emeritus. I was chair of the student affairs committee during my time there. And that, that there was a, there's a lot that, uh, I, uh, could see and had perhaps some influence on, or at least, uh, weighed in on in terms of, um, equity inclusion, um, the, the, the sense of uh, diversity on the campus, uh, and also, you know, it, it, I guess no sooner was I off the board than uh, a month later, you know, of course, the George Floyd incident blew America up and woke a lot of Americans up and woke a lot of things up at Colgate as well. Um, and while President Casey is, I believe, um, an ally, we could not have, it's hard to imagine having uh, a more, uh, more of an ally in the president's office than we have. We can do a whole lot worse. Um, and his instinct and his, his leadership, uh, I think is, is to be encouraged and he has been open and he's talked a lot, uh, you know, privately, publicly, uh, to everybody. And, and it's really, um, his leadership, I think it, it gives us an opportunity to, to make some significant strides. As you mentioned, uh, you know, his cabinet is, is a diverse cabinet beginning with Dr. Hux, the number two person executive at Colgate University. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. I'm so I'm so pleased and proud and 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 think that this is an opportunity for us. But so no sooner than I was off the trustee board, my seat was not cool when um, you know, George Floyd happened and and the board decided to establish an ad hoc committee to look at diversity, equity and inclusion and asked me to come back and to be uh, involved in that committee. Uh, it is chaired by a couple of existing trustees, as, um, you know, um, Deniston Reed, who you have had on the podcast, is on that committee, along with uh, Clarissa Shaw. And then uh, there are a number of other existing trustees uh, on that, that as well. And, and so what we're charged with doing is to help the board understand and get aligned uh, and support efforts across the university, support the president, because I, I think, and I give the board credit, I give uh, Mike Hurling, who's the you know, chairman now, the credit for recognizing that this is everybody's work. Mm -hmm. We can't 
and and you know a board is supposed to be fifty thousand feet. It's supposed to hire the president and maybe have significant stay on the you know the top executives, give them goals, measure them and evaluate them, and basically stay away. Yep. But on this level, we recognize it is to be recognized that systemic you know systemic bias and injustice is permeates uh, in in throughout the university and the way we make decisions the you know we may not even be aware or conscious of how they trickle down and impact people on and our students in, excuse me in particular on you know on a day-to-day -day basis and how they may be impediments to uh to opportunity to feeling welcome wanted included to achieving all that you can be you know and and we and, and we need to be thoughtful about that we need to begin to know what we don't know and so the the committee is really charged and we're still um figuring out how we are going to uh make sure that colgate that DEI is infused in Colgate. It should not be, it should not sit outside of the, uh, the third century plan. It should be, you know, embedded directly in every aspect of the third century plan and any strategic planning and things of that sort. Things that we're doing um, at the board level, they, you may or may not know that they did increase the number of uh, seats on our board so that we can, they added four, seats and we have to go, you know down in the weeds to tell you that we have uh, had to go to the state to get the authority to add members to our to our, our trustee board but four seats were added with the idea that those would be uh for to to increase the diversity of the board so so there will be four new members uh and they will be diverse uh, we recognize that we have shortcomings in that area, in spite of the fact that while I was on the nominating committee, I mean, that was, that's just a constant struggle. Um, but we have to do better. Um, in addition, each one of the committees of the board has got to be charged with some goals on the DEI front. And that's programmatic committees, that's, that's the academic committee, that's, you know, uh, campus life, that's uh, finance, you know, and buildings and grounds and things of that sort. We can, we have to understand, and we, we're looking not just at student life, we're looking also at the faculty. Um, we need to look also at the staff and not overlook, you know, the fact that there are people of color uh, and women and others who are underrepresented and how they're being treated or what opportunities they have. So um, it, it, this needs to permeate, this needs to be in our DNA. This, and from my perspective, what's really important here is that we have to make sure, look, uh, Brian Casey isn't gonna be there forever. Tracy Huck's not gonna be there forever. Leroy Cody isn't gonna be on the board. You know, um, So 20 years from now, the next generation and the generation after that uh, should have the benefit of having the structures of uh, taken down, the ones that are, um, you know, holding us back, and that new protocols, processes, procedures should should now reflect uh, a thought, a thoughtfulness about equity and inclusion all the way through from day one, and it should survive whoever the administration is. It should survive whoever the trustees are. And so that's what we're trying to build toward. Um, you know that we're hiring a chief diversity officer. Uh, we're hopeful that that will uh, be in place before the uh, coming semester. Um, and the important thing is to know that that person will sit on the, on the president's staff and but will have uh, in, so we'll have input into all of the different departments across the campus. So, but 
the one thing that really is important is that that person isn't the only person. Mm -hmm. It's not, you can't just say, hey, it's, it, it's your job. Good luck. You got to be supported. You got to have resources. You got to be, you have to have uh, colleagues and collaboration throughout the organization. Uh, and I think we, we're beginning to turn the corner on that. I think it's great to hear. I think it's um, there's there's definitely a sense we've never arrived, right? So this there's this continuing to push, which I think is good to be reminded of, um, that we have to acknowledge what we are doing right, but continue to make it better and better for the people that are following us. I think I also want to just acknowledge also the shift in tuition that they recently made, oh, where. They have waived tuition for uh, students that have family incomes under $80,000. And to me, what is so significant about that is I know to your point about having graduated now for us, it's been 30 years. We've noticed a shift, at least of our perception in terms of the type of student that was being enrolled in Colgate, the type of student of color. We felt like it was more middle class. It was a more private school. and where again, I'm all for as many students of color access in Colgate University because I think it is a life-changing experience. What I also know is for those who are experiencing their families are coming from low income, Colgate can be a generational shift for that family. And so to me, I never want to deprive that student of changing their whole family's trajectory by having a Colgate education. And so the fact that they've made that uh, accommodation or policy shift, I think is going to yield some some dividends that we are going to look forward you to. You use a word that is my favorite word, and that is tra trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what keeps me going and keeps me motivated about staying involved with Colgate because I see the way that trajectories can be changed. Mm -hmm. And that's what's and and that's what it's all about. And and it goes this goes full circle back to what you first said about how I impacted you, you know, your life, because I was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't before. You know, I've been missing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that would be just one uh, uh, um, the epiphany to me that it that that has come about is that, you know, we all leave legacies mm -hmm. and the leg legacy can be absence, mm. void, mm. or it can be one of being engaged, being involved, just showing up. And you never know how that will change, have an opportunity to change somebody's life. And that's what Colgate can do is change people's tra trajectories. But we, and, and this and this leads to one other point is and I get on my high horse about this is that Let's get on it. Let's big go. <laughs> 50 year change the big 50 year change is there were 18 of us in that class. Now there are the numbers are so much bigger, but but what's more important is that uh, across 50 years, we are now people of color are roughly 10% of all the living uh alumni of colgate university that's critical mass that's three or four thousand wow. people wow we are three or four thousand strong and it's not going to go away it's right. permanent mm -hmm. and actually that's what uh encouraged me encourages me about the future because that permanence and our voice and our engagement means uh we can be impactful on the university, on the administration, on trustees, for students, for faculty, for staff who are there going forward in a more powerful way than I ever imagined. When I left here, when I left Colgate, I thought they ain't never going to get no brothers <laughs> coming up. And but look, I'm sitting here talking to you guys. <laughs> I had no idea. And that's that's the one thing I'd say if I could go back as a 20 year old and say, young man, take those blinders off and think outside the box. 
to, to expound upon uh, the, the subject matter of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion with a specific sort of uh, call to action for uh, alumni of color. I, I'd be interested in hearing your take on if folks ask, how can alumni of color get uh, involved specifically around the areas of impacting diversity, equity, and inclusion, besides just being, you know, the traditional ways that Colgate reaches out to alum, whether it be for donations or reunion weekend, but are there opportunities now that the subject matter is, I guess, become formal with a committee and a chair and so forth? Uh, what would be your 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 recommendations, your advice? Because we're we our goal is to really reignite that AOC leverage that that network, and, and it may sound selfish. And and although the benefits are for the university and for the current students of color, you know, we need to be the support for each other. We we've got a network that we are not leveraging for each other right now mm -hmm. in our current day life. And uh, if uh, I'd be if excited to hear what your your recommendations are. Well, there's. I think there's many ways to get involved. Uh, and the most important thing is um, to show up, to be there. And there are opportunities. And you mentioned uh, Veronica McFall, Ronnie McFall, and the work that she does to try to connect alums with students who are on campus now and uh, in meaningful ways as they struggle to come to grips with the academic challenges, the social challenges, cultural challenges on campus, uh, and as they, um, you know, try to just just manage their way and be, just to be encouraged. But more importantly, you know, there's there's also, you know, Alana is there, and Alana uh, is in need of the touch uh, and engagement of alums of color as well. Uh, we have discovered, I think, through a, both Alana and uh, Veronica, that uh, you know the technology, the the, the the value of the pandemic is realized. Yes, we can get together, uh, get people to talk to students, and not necessarily have to be on campus. Mm -hmm. So now it's an hour of your time instead of hours of your time and travel and all that. Um, I'm big personally on giving. It's not necessarily part of um, our, sometimes not part of our culture to think about generosity, to think about donating. Um, but in even small ways, it, it has an impact. It says that you're involved. Um, along the way, I've had opportunities to try to help build funds such as the uh, for, for the um, Adam Clayton Paul Jr. Scholarship uh, several years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, taking a look at the, the paltry amount that was there in the endowment and wanting to make an effort to try to um, grow that by we had a capital campaign, we wanted to just double it. It, it. You know, we know what the cost of going to Colgate is. So right now, that that uh, those, those funds are providing a portion of the support for one student each year. But uh, the, the more we can grow that, um, the, the more money we'll be able to support um, students, you know, uh, with their tuition or their the cost of room and board. In addition, uh, there, you know, I felt very strongly that as we hit the 200 year, the, the bicentennial celebration, that we needed to make sure that future generations know that we were here mm -hmm. at the 200 year mark. Mm -hmm. So looking for something a little more permanent and, and, and actually uh, work closely with uh, Chef uh, Siobhan Martin, who's uh, chair of the uh, AOC, to get established an endowment that would provide in perpetuity monies to support programming for uh, alumni or students of color. Mm -hmm. so, um, and, and so that's uh, that's in place now. It's a, again, it's a small amount, but you know, giving $13 or $100 or what you can, or a few thousand dollars if you can, uh, really, uh, 
is is important to do. So I uh, would really love to hear a little bit about who you are now, um, who you've been. Just kind of walk us through that journey of after after Colgate. Uh, how did you get to be this person? So um, the person that I am now, first of all, I, I, I had a, a I want to give honor to God because I have grown in my faith over the years. Uh, I am from um, a devout family, having gone to church every day, every Sunday, you know, for all of my life growing up, but, you know, really getting away from that, uh, as many of us do for so many years. And now, uh, as at this stage of my life, you know, giving a lot of time and energy to the church that I'm involved with. So I want to give God uh, honor and glory there. Um, I've been a, I'm, I'm an investment guy. I had a wonderful, you know, career on Wall Street. Uh, it's nice to be able to do something that you enjoy and you love. Uh, and every day is different. And, and it doesn't feel like work when you're doing that. Um, but now I'm retired quote unquote retired uh, uh, and retirement is a different word than it meant for my father's generation mm -hmm. or and act, actually that doesn't apply to my father anyway he never you know he was not a retiring person but uh, but an older generation often thought about kicking back in the uh, recliner but uh, but that's not for me either so I'm uh, advising uh, startup businesses in the investment world and staying involved with that staying involved with my church um, uh, very involved uh, with my family, uh, which is um, a loving family and is, is spread far and wide across the country. Can, can you take us back just a little bit of when, when you left Colgate, did you know, was your trajectory to say, this is what I want to do? Or were, were there just pivots in life that, you know, you sort of were guided that way by the universe and ended up in that lane and 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 then obviously executed accordingly i knew that i um you know i had an affinity for business for management issues and uh pretty good with with math math and you know not 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 intimidated by it uh i always took on challenges so uh, you know i went you know to be the in everything that i did most everything i did I was the only or the first in the world of high finance, Wall Street. Went to the Wharton School, um, where my, by the way, my activism could continued. But uh, you know, in 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 life, I I took on these challenges, knowing that, uh, and I think, for better or for worse, Colgate helped prepare me for that. That that I was going to be that the tip of the spear to get in there, to be by myself, to deal with whatever was thrown my way and uh, whatever obstacles were there. Um, I, again, been blessed that I made choices, was drawn to things that put me in some, in, meeting incredible people and in incredible situations, uh, high finance, some of the quote unquote, brightest people uh, in the business world and the finance world and being there as an advisor and as a, um, uh, I guess, a, a, a trusted fiduciary and counterpart to whatever that they were doing. He uh, doesn't want to say that he was the expert in the room. That's, 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 <laughs> so I, I'm going to say it for well, him. Well, you, well, you, well, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> we have to be the best. Yeah, well, yeah, you absolutely. can't be there. You can't, you know, you're better than everybody in the room be, just by virtue of who you are. And they may or may not be, uh, you mm -hmm. know, on point, but but you have to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kogay told us that for sure. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so with, with, with that being said, uh, a very rich, rich 50 year reflection on, on the evolution uh if you could go back and advise yourself as the 17 year old entering Colgate with what you know now, and, and that 21 year old exiting Colgate into the world with what you know now, 
what would that advice be? Okay, absolutely. Um, I would say be optimistic. Mm. Shoot for the stars. I would say don't let anyone take your joy, mm. whatever you do. Uh, a wise man once told me when I was at a low point, he said, you know, when things are bad, they're almost never as bad as you think. Mm. But don't mm. forget that when things are good, they're probably not as good as you think. Mm. And, I, and I have uh, remembered that for, for quite some time, and that's meant a lot to me. So, little surprise question when you look at your um, extracurricular activities while you were at Colgate is there one that stands out as a favorite hmm <laughs> you know look I'd say uh, being a DJ was just fun and it's fun yeah. to talk about and I was yeah. the, I was the funky judge and uh <laughs> You know, I, any I, you recordings, know, any recordings that we can go back into the archives? And listen to any of those? <laughs> I don't know. There was a <laughs> there was a song that came out. I think uh, this guy was a one hit wonder. It was called The Funky Judge. And I kind of took it, took that and ran with it. But uh, that 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 moniker for people who are who get to be who get to know me. And some of them have been some of my white colleagues. Uh, we, we've had a lot of fun uh, with that nickname. Nice, 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 nice. Could, could um, that have been an alternate career path and maybe, you know, reincarnated, come back as, a, as an air personality? Do you think that, you know, you're going to oh, take you it know, to the we next all level? have those uh, visions of ourselves as some sort of uh, <laughs> talent and celebrity. But right now I, I live vicariously through particularly, well, through both of my sons for different reasons. But uh, the younger one is, is, is a uh, is a hip hop music producer. OK, <laughs> that's what's up. So he yeah. keeps it young. Yeah, ah, and my, on, and my oldest on. son is is a rocket scientist, uh, you know, uh, electrical engineer with NVIDIA. So there you go. Mm. Oh, wow. So when we when we get off the call, I will make sure to text some information on um, my TV series so that you can share that with your son. Okay. Um, so Pharaoh's Army, we are running a crowdfunding campaign. So for all those who are listening, please go to <laughs> Seed and Spark. Yes, Look sir. up Pharaoh's Army and donate and show some love to our TV series. But it's going to infuse hip hop and deal with this okay. intergenerational dynamic that is happening right now, trying to have these conversations about social justice, okay. police brutality, uh, racial disparity. But that'll course, be right up his alley. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything you'd like to share, promote? Um, here's an opportunity for you to get word out to the uh, listeners, alumni of color, what would you like to share with us today? You know, um, the only thing I would encourage people to do is, um, especially, you know, especially I would like to uh, ask people to look, uh, make a donation to the alumni of color third century fund. Uh, you can do that through a whole lot of different uh, you know, electronic uh, ways uh, through the Colgate website and things of that sort. That name is the Alumni of Color Third Century Fund. Um, there are other um, opportunities to direct money to specifically to things that may benefit uh, students of color. Um, you know about Diane uh, Sacconi's fund. There is the Adam Clayton Paul, Paul Jr. Scholarship Fund and so forth. So look up those opportunities. And I would just encourage people to do that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. Any last words, uh, co-host, guests, before we wrap up? This has been would amazing. love to uh, a plug uh, for you to identify any of the classmates that you have had uh that you're still in contact with uh you, you talk about some of those relationships that you have today that that stem from there and yeah. um, um and, you know uh, alvin and i you know get to brag about you know being 30 years removed and our friendship only getting stronger with the years and then i hear 50 years and i'm like well oof, we got a lot to go you know and so um we are looking for uh 
or, or lumber cross all boats. Some of the women that 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 uh, that you may know of that um, would would help share their story and experience. Um, and sometimes, you know, it it it, it takes that you know, email from, from, from Leroy to say, okay, I'll get, I'll get on, I'll get on the show. Um, and so, um, please uh, plug those, uh, recommend them, we can call them out, you know, let them know they're going to be getting <laughs> emailed from us, but, uh, that would help us out tremendously. Mm -hmm. I will definitely do that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our listeners. Um, this has been another episode of Aftergate powered by the Defy Life Network. And you will definitely hear us on your favorite platforms. Shout out to our interns, Kathy, Izzy, Sophia. Appreciate all the work y'all are doing. And check out the many episodes we got to follow, which will definitely involve more women guests. <laughs> For sure. For sure. For sure. <laughs> we, we are noticing. Just Duly noted. Guys. Duly noted. Okay. Right. Thank you, brothers. Peace. You know, this has been fantastic. I'll never... I, this will, this, will, this will be a highlight for sure. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Appreciate that. that. Thank you. Thank you for right. the support. Shh. You hear that? Listen closer. That, my friend, is the deafening sound of focus. It drowns out all the useless noise that can clutter the moment. Naysayers don't exist. Haters? Smaters? The peanut gallery? Who's that? When you're in your zone... All that noise and all that buzz is just elevator music. So, enjoy your journey, focus on your goal, and bask in the quiet roar that is progress. Because when it's your time to shoot that shot, spit that verse, or close that deal, the only voice that matters is yours. Defy life. <laughs>